very much to everyone at the Royal College of Pathologists. That was a fascinating workshop uh, and obviously very topical. I'm sure everyone really appreciated being able to ask questions directly to experts, certainly judging, <laughs> judging by the number of questions that came in. That was brilliant. Thank you. So now we are very pleased to welcome our fourth keynote speaker, Professor Trudy Lang, Director of the Global Health Network at Nuffield Department of Medicine at the University of Oxford, who will discuss why we need health research uh, to solve the pandemic. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much um, for inviting me. Um, I've spent um, around 20 years working on infectious diseases um, in various places around the world, mostly in Africa, a little bit in Asia, and um, in fact, I started my career in the north of Peru, working on worm infections in children. So I've had um, some quite fun experiences around the world working on some devastating diseases, um, meeting some incredible people trying to solve these problems. And infectious diseases um, are constantly with us. They've been with us for a millennia. You know, they found evidence of malaria around the times of the dinosaurs. And so they're not new. They're a constant uh, companion to us as, as humankind. And then, of course, we get new ones pop up every now and again, which um, everybody's learned about this year, haven't we, with um, with COVID. But of course, we're used to um, emerging pandemics and epidemics. And um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about some of my experiences with some previous disease outbreaks um, and also perhaps think in a slightly um, sideways way about what this might what we might have learned and, and what this means for us. In, in understanding these pathogens and tackling them. So I've actually spent many years trying to give talks about why research is important, but I think we probably all know that now, don't we? Um, we've learned how we've had to work really hard on research to get the vaccines we're all um, seeing being delivered um, somewhat slowly in some areas of the world, but certainly well. Um, but look at the um, mortality rates we've experienced with COVID, and you can see how um, how devastating it is and how important it is that we we get information together as quickly as possible so if i just think back a little bit first to ebola um which um pops up every now and again mainly in, in west africa and it's um it's a horrific disease and causes just masses of devastation and when you have an outbreak like this um as researchers what we're trying to do is is get into these settings um to work with local teams as soon as possible so that we can first of all understand the burden of disease who it's impacting how we can um what well, we do disease characterization studies which is where you you really work out what it is that the disease is doing to the to a human is it causing um uh hospitalizable diseases is it causing um some of the um the most devastating effects very quickly or is it a more um a less impactful disease that maybe isn't causing a massive symptomatic infection in lots of people but can cause some huge trouble for others so something like ebola the mortality rate is more like 70 percent but um something like um covid is is much more much much lower as we know it's probably less than five percent and so there's um a very, very huge difference between these disease characterizations and it's really important that that's the first thing we understand and then how these diseases are transmitted is it between human to human or is it between um the most um potentially through through mosquitoes or, or how how is it transmitted from person to person the challenges for doing research is that when you do a, a research study anywhere on any disease you need to be absolutely sure that the research is completely ethical. So that means you've had consent from the patients, the patients are understanding what you're asking them to do, and that the research is safe, that you, you're, you're either giving an intervention or taking samples or anything you're going to do within that research context in a way that doesn't cause risk to the participant um, beyond the disease. And so that we've got a very rigorous global system for um, making sure that research is safe and ethical and high quality and so anywhere we do research in the world we have to work to these same standards and so that is as you can imagine really difficult to achieve in a disease outbreak 
but it's very, very important. And then we also need to know that um, we can get this research going as quickly as possible. And so sometimes those two things are very difficult because normally to put research in place, it can take up to a year or 18 months. But as we've seen with the phenomenal success we've had with the COVID vaccine, for example, um, that research has happened much, much, much faster than um, than is normally anything like possible. And so what we always do is work with local teams, local governments, local health researchers to try and um, make sure that these um, research systems can be put in place as quickly as possible, that local healthcare workers are trained, and then we can run um, research as well as possible in these um, very dramatic and difficult contexts. So just to show you how this looks, you know, it normally takes um, all this time to get a research study up and running. And in, in an acute infection like this, the, the, the outbreaks can even come and go before researchers have even got going. And so within um, any new outbreak, the challenge is just to try and get research embedded into the immediate response so that we can understand the diseases as quickly as possible. So I often give talks in schools and I usually ask everybody in the audience to think about um, other diseases they know. And some, um, when we think about pandemics and epidemics like um, Ebola, it's, it's always the dramatic ones that people think of. But you know, there's so many other um, diseases that have been um, infecting mankind for for as long as mankind's been here. And Ebola was awful and very devastating. COVID is causing just such global global devastation. It's almost hard to um, really understand that. But there've been other pandemics and there'll be more in the future. And there's lots of diseases that carry on causing these same sorts of tolls, um, especially in populations um, in the most poorest setting. So just one example, um, tuberculosis is, um, a devastating disease and it's and it's it's called the silent killer as well because so many um adults walk around with silent tuberculosis in their lungs and they pass it on but you know every year um there's about a million and a half deaths and what's probably quite um sad and this is true for for diseases like um, malaria and hiv as well is because the um because the whole um focus has been on COVID quite rightly, um, because this is just such a global catastrophe. But what that has meant is that some of the healthcare settings are having to switch to focusing on COVID. And that's meant they haven't had the attention to give other diseases. And that's because labs have been repurposed and, um, and the attention's had to go elsewhere. And so that's a really um, worrying side effect of, of COVID that um, other diseases are, are looking even more um, devastating than they previously were. Um, just to give some idea of um, the sort of overall mortalities every year, um, these are the ongoing burdens of disease of the, of, um, across the globe. And you can see um, how things like um, HIV, AIDS, and even things that people don't really think about so much, maybe is, that seems really trivial to us in the West, things like diarrhea kills over half a million people every year. And these are ongoing day-to-day -day diseases of poverty that grind down these areas. I've spent most of my career working on malaria and, and that kills um, probably nearly a million children under five every year, especially in Africa. And this is just an ongoing um, disease which, which has um, what we call sort of further outbreaks every year because sometimes you can really tackle it in a community and then it picks back up again but it's still there and it's still with us. And trying to run um, vaccine trials in those sorts of settings are really, really challenging, um, but, but no less important as, as you can imagine. Zika came along um, about five or six years ago and out of the blue really in, um, in Brazil and Latin America, and it was just really through the world because it was such an unusual presentation in causing this microcephaly in babies. And there was an immense research effort that happened very quickly to, that, under, that, that found out very fast, really, how it was being spread by mosquitoes and, and trying to prevent women um, catching a Zika virus during pregnancy. But that research effort at the beginning really helped to address that. 
but you know making the decisions on what diseases to focus on are really is really very challenging indeed and um and where to spend the money and part of the research challenge is making the decisions on what research to do where but i think the most important point is is that there's just no one single disease or any um any disease really occurring in isolation and so what we try and think about is health systems and everything from hygiene as you can see here with the children to uh, health education and understanding in the community what their perceptions of disease are and really working with communities so they can spot diseases but also work within their populations to try and prevent disease spread and and promote better health practices so there's, it's really important that there's a scientific response and, at the beginning of an outbreak to understand the pathogen, know what it's doing in the community. And I think what, if I can make any point at all today, it's really that um, COVID was just absolutely devastating for us all, but it's not really any different than most infectious diseases we're tackling. And I hope that if any good has come of it, we can at least um, learn from the remarkable fast uh, global research effort that's happened with COVID and hopefully share some of that knowledge across the other devastating diseases of policy and ongoing pandemics that are still going on. So that's my last slide, because <laughs> I've tried to gallop through in time. So do we have time that's, for questions? That's excellent, yeah. Trudy. Yes, I'm sure we do. Um, if schools would like to post some questions in chat, that would be great. And I'd like to welcome back at this point uh, the co-chairs of Science for You, Kimberly Gilmore, consultant, clinical scientist, in immunology, and Stuart Adams, principal clinical scientist, both from Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children, NHS Foundation Trust. Thank you very much, Nick and Trudy. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, a really good overview. Um, I will start because we're waiting for the uh, students to put some questions in is what do you do? I mean, you talked about ethics and as you said very rightly, all research is done under ethically approved studies and we need to make sure it's safe. Um, what's your approach if someone's too sick to consent to a study? So for example, I'm thinking about Ebola and if the patients coming in are very ill, they're not in a position to understand necessarily or consent. What do you do then? Yeah, that's an excellent question. We actually um, pioneered a process actually in malaria some years ago in East Africa, uh, where we use, um, we've, got, we've got an approach called deferred consent, where we can um, seek um, to try and get uh, verbal consent from a family member if they're present, but often with Ebola and those emergencies they're not. And then we can seek to get consent later from the family. Um, so we're never, we never, we don't like to say there's no consent, but it might be that you have to act as in an emergency and then you go back and get full consent later if the patient survives. Thank you. That's ex that's really helpful and informative. Yeah. Hi, Trude. Yeah, that is a, a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, so clearly health inequality is here and it's probably here to stay. Uh, but are things improving as far as health treatments across the globe or are we in a place where it's stagnant? Yeah, that's such a good question. So I spend a lot of my time at the moment talking about inequity in health. And it's it's not just, you know, there's such a push to try and have universal health coverage and health equity. But I argue a lot about equity in health research and that it should be that everywhere in the globe there's equal opportunities to take part in research and benefit from evidence. But if you look at how the Ebola research has rolled out and sorry, how COVID research has rolled out, there really is far too little research going on in the global south and and obviously then the rollout of the research and the vaccine availability it's just you know i'm really worried that it's just becoming a, a, a wider gap and of course all the distractions from other ongoing research projects are far greater in the global south than they are in the north so i think at the moment it's a worse problem that's great thank you Trudy and, and thank you so much for giving up your time today we really appreciate it and I, and I think the students will have enjoyed this too um I think we'll now have to move on to our next speaker in in, in uh, interest of time 